thank you for the kind introduction. Again, I'm Seth Graham. I work for MoFo here in Tokyo. Um, and I've been practicing for 15 years here, working with established and emerging companies to protect, enforce, and license their IP right. Um, usually events like this are smart enough to keep lawyers off the stage, but I appreciate the platform here today to talk on Founders Day about founding IP issue. So uh, again, this is intellectual property basics for founders. There's a lot to cover, uh, and I will do my best to talk at a very high level to uh, give you the basics. Uh, quick disclaimer, this isn't legal advice, it's educational, obviously facts matter, so please talk to a lawyer when you need to. Um, so I'm gonna talk about why IP is important, then I'm gonna talk about basic concepts of IP so you're aware of them, and then I will conclude with some practical tips that may be useful to the founders in the audience. So first, uh, why should you care about IP? The first point is to secure ownership. IP is an asset. It's something you work hard to secure. It's something you work hard to create. And unless you take the right steps to actually secure your ownership to this asset, it can be lost. So that's the first reason. The second reason is to drive value for your company. Now, most people think about this as, oh, I'll build a big portfolio of patents and investors will think I'm worth all this money. That's true. There's a perceptual issue there. But there's also value in creating a competitive advantage for your company. You protect your product better, you'll compete better in the marketplace. Also, it differentiate you from competition. Your brand will distinguish you in the market, help you succeed and be recognized. Third, obviously the demonstrated ability to innovate, that is the patent point, to show investors you know how to protect your IP, you know what's valuable about your company. And lastly, licensing and enforcing your IP. If you develop something and other people want to use it, you can make money by licensing it. You can also enforce it to keep other people out of the market. So those are the key takeaways, and again, I'm going to go through more specifics. So when we talk about IP, what are we talking about? There's four fundamental categories, trade secrets, trademarks, patents, and copyrights. I'm going to go through each of these in turn very briefly, but those are the four pillars that I'll be speaking about. But in general, what does IP rights mean? So first, they're intangible rights. Intellectual property rights are not things. They are rights in things. They still have value. It's a line on your accounting sheet, but they are rights fundamentally. Second, they protect different aspects of your good and service. So a copyright will protect the software and your platform. Your trademark will protect the brand under which you sell or provide that product. The patent will protect the invention that is embodied in that. And so there are different aspects and ways that you can protect your goods and services through intellectual property rights. They protect you for different periods of time. Patents are 20 years, copyright 75, at least that in the US, all part of your strategy about protecting IP. And they are a form of legalized monopoly. You have exclusive rights to do things under intellectual property rights in a patent to use an invention, in a copyright to use the software, the movie, or the picture that you create. And lastly, you can enforce this against other people, and that's part of the stick, the power of IP and protecting it for your company. So then the four pillars I alluded to before, let me go through them briefly. So what is a trade secret? Trade secret is information that has value by virtue of being secret. So the classic example is the formula for Coca-Cola, Google's algorithm. Right? These are things that no one fully knows, and yet because the businesses can leverage those secrets, they have value. Now, the key word there is secret. To have a trade secret, it needs to be kept secret. So that can be obviously not disclosing it to anyone except under very strict terms of confidentiality, having an NDA in place. But even more than that, it can be protected within a company, uh, you know, protecting email, putting it behind a locked file, not letting employees see it. And sophisticated companies employ all these techniques for their most valuable trade secrets. Um, to, to protect it, you have the NDAs, you have those measures, uh, and it can last forever. That's the incredible thing about a trade secret. As long as it has that value and you take measures to protect it, it has value for as long as you protect it. Lastly, it's important with your employees. So a lot of times we see uh, you know, startups break up, founders go their separate ways. If the company owns that trade secret and your employee wants to take it and use it elsewhere, you can stop them. You can sue them for misappropriation. That's why it's important that the company owns the trade secret and why you protect it. Patents. Patents are a little bit different. So trade secrets you protect as secret. Patents, when you try to get a patent, you actually have to teach the invention, right? When you file a patent application, the claims tell people what your invention is. So it's disclosed. Patent application is an application to ask the government for protection of that invention. The application doesn't confer any rights. 
it gives you the start for people to look at the invention and see if it will be granted. Only when you get a registration do you have that grant of exclusivity, that right to exclude others from practicing your invention. But when we talk about patentable, uh, patents, what are we talking about? What's patentable? Well, it has to be novel, non-obvious, and useful. So novel means it's new. It's not already in the market. And of course, there's nuance there, but generally it's new. Non-obvious, that it has an inventive step, right? That there's something that isn't obvious to someone skilled in the art to be implemented by the invention. And then it's useful. You can implement it. You can teach people what the invention is through your claim so that it can be protected. It's clear. There are different types of patent applications. Someone who spoke here today and who's in the audience right now knows that you can file a provisional application. That's usually where you don't have the full invention scoped up yet, but you know you have something that you want to protect. So you file a provisional to hold your space in line. Patents are first to file. The first one who gets there and files the patent gets the protection. A provisional is kind of like a stepstone to kind of hold your place in line. And then there's a normal patent application where you're actually asking for government protection. Lastly, how are patents exploited? You license them so people can practice your invention. You sue them from stopping from using it. Timing is critical. I already alluded to getting to be first in line is key for patents. Typically, you want to do it earlier, but be very mindful. If you're disclosing your invention not under confidential terms, or if you're selling products that embody your invention before you get a patent, you may prejudice your rights to get the patents. You need to be very careful about that. I'm going to skip freedom of operate because it's complicated and I don't have the time. So trademarks, what is a trademark? Trademark is a word, a symbol, a logo, anything that you sell associated with your product and service in commerce, right? Um, so that can be anything for a good and service. Again, it can be a logo, a picture, what have you. When you're searching for a trademark, there are databases online. You can search what people have registered. You can search what they use for their goods and services. And I highly recommend you do that. I'll come back to an example about that in a second. Trademarks, if you use them appropriately, can be protected forever. And lastly, strength. Uh, I will date myself with this example, but when uh, movie tickets online first came out, there was a company called Movie Phone. Obviously, you call up on the phone and buy tickets to a movie. Their competitor was called Fandango, which was very unique, right? Fandango gets stronger protection. There's no other name like that. People can associate it better with the actual good or, or with the actual company. Descriptive marks get less protection. Just a rule of thumb to be mindful of when you choose your trademark. Lastly, copyrights. Copyrights protect any uh, work of authorship that's fixed in a medium of expression. Movies, software, music, um, what have you. Um, they get 75 years of protection uh, and basically give you, or 70 years, and basically give you the exclusive right to prevent other people from using that. So another person can't take your software, create something substantially similar without your permission. And that's the right and the power that copyright affords. Um, most people don't register copyrights. They probably should. If you want to sue someone, you definitely should because you can get better damages from other people. Fair use is a concept that allows some people to use others' copyrighted work uh, for a limited scope of use. It's a very hot topic today with use of data to train AI models. It's a very complicated concept, so I don't have time to go into that. But note that there are limited circumstances when you can use others' copyrighted works. So now my tips. Tip number one, address IP issues at formation. We had a company a couple of years ago who came in, they were working on a financial services platform. They had the founders all splitting up because they didn't like each other, didn't want to work together. They never assigned the IP to the company. That's the key point that you need to take away. IP needs to be owned by the company and not by its employees. That whole dispute could have been avoided if they had set up a structure in the beginning so that the company, all IP was vesting in the company. Well, how do you do that? Invention assignment agreements. Every founder, every key employee, every contractor should be signing an agreement so that anything they create, all that IP vests in the company. They can carve some things out of that if there's something they don't want to contribute, but it is absolutely fundamental that you sign those agreements. When we at MoFo bring in companies and advise them, we just give them the agreement, right? They have it in hand. They can use it from day one. Um, you also want to clarify if the founders aren't contributing something to the business so that if they do split up, they go their own way. The company knows what it owns and they know what they don't own. So don't put it down the line, address it at formation. Tip number two, perform a basic search. Uh, this may seem obvious. Uh, I have another good friend here in Tokyo. Uh, his, him and his wife are very much into gin, started a gin company, uh, went to some contests, won a gin contest in England, 
starting to build up a lot of goodwill with a fancy label on their bottle. They get back, they set up their corporation and shit, you know, someone had registered that trademark in Japan and Europe already. So you can imagine the embarrassment of having to go back and change the name of your company because you didn't take the time at the beginning to make sure that you could use that trademark. So do those searches. There's an analog on the IP side. If you have a new company, you can search patents to see if other people are doing the same kind of thing and have patents to block you. A lot of the time you won't do that as a startup, to be frank. It's an expensive exercise. It's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort with lawyers, but it's an, op it's an option to pursue and that's called a freedom to operate search. That's tip number two. Uh, do the clearance searches up front. Tip number three, invest in form agreements. Uh, I already mentioned the invention assignment agreement. Uh, another one of those is a non-disclosure agreement. You should not be talking about your business idea with third parties except under an NDA, right? Get it signed. It's standard practice. You're not embarrassing anyone. You're not being unreasonable by asking for that. Get people to sign an NDA and protect your business idea for patentability reasons, a whole host of other reasons. That's another agreement we just give away when we bring in a company in. The last thing I'd mention here is a customer agreement. You may be licensing software, you'd be selling widgets, you may be exploiting your IP in another way, but negotiate off your own agreement. Pay a lawyer, get, a, get an agreement in place that you feel comfortable negotiating. It will be more efficient in the long run. You'll know how to negotiate it. You know where you're comfortable giving and where you're not comfortable giving. It's worth the investment up front. The cost is definitely uh, not the driver there. So that's tip number three. Tip number four, manage how you use third-party materials. So many of us, uh, if you're a founder, you know, the, the budget's tight, you're trying to build a platform, you may want to in-license software, you may want to use OSS, open source software to help build your platform. You need to make sure, you may use cloud hosting services too. You have to make sure you're complying with the rights that you're getting, right? A lot of people pay no attention to this, but if you sign a software in-license and you're only allowed to internally use that software and then you put it in a product, you're violating that contract and someone is going to sue you or at least take your money. So you need to manage how you're using third-party materials. Uh, review terms of use if you're pulling data off the web, such as to train an AI model. You may not be able to do that. You're also exposing yourself to suit in that manner. You also don't want to overcommit. Don't grant people exclusivity. Don't exclusively license things from certain people because you're trapping yourself in earlier in your business life and you want to be careful how you do this. Open source is a whole other animal. Be mindful of certain open source, if you copy it, reproduce it, and distribute it, you may have to distribute source code, your improvement, to the community for free. Lastly, tip number five, document how you use materials and retain your records. When investors come knocking, you're doing a B round, and you can say, here's my software in licenses, here's what I use it for, here's my open source that I use, here's all the IPs and the inventions we've protected, and you lay it out in front of them immediately boost the value, right? You'll be able to be offer better reps and warranties and they will respect you for your organization. I think I did pretty well in 15 minutes. Brief plug for my firm. We have 170 lawyers worldwide. We do all types of VC and VC work, including here in Tokyo. And it was a great pleasure to speak before all of you today. Thank you very much.